Right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Daiwa Anglo Japanese Foundation. So, uh, my name is Jason James, and at this point, I normally introduce the speaker, and I'm going to do that, but the speaker is actually me uh, uh, um, for a change. We did this last year as well, so maybe this is going to be like a New Year tradition um, that I, I um, get interested in various bizarre Japan related stories, and it's a good opportunity to tell you some of them.、Um, so, So, anyway,、um, well, quite a lot of you probably know me,、um, and I'm not quite sure what I should say to introduce myself, but I first visited Japan at the age of 13 on a choir tour、um, by King's College Choir, Cambridge, which I was a boy in.、Um, and I sort of got bitten by the bug and decided to study Japanese at Cambridge a few years later. And then I worked in banking、um, because everybody did if they graduated in the 80s. Um, but I quite enjoyed banking and stayed in it for quite a long time. And then I worked for the British Council in Japan, and then I came back and started doing this job. So I've been here for about、uh, 11 years now. Right, so that's enough about me.、Um, we're going to talk about Wilkinson Tansan mineral water. You may think this looks a fairly, I was going to say a dry subject, but dry is <laughs> it's one thing it isn't.、Um, Uh, and this came about because about eight or nine years ago, a lady、uh, who is a friend of a friend approached me and she said she was trying to research her family history.、Um, but she was having difficulty because there wasn't really anything in English.、Um, and could I help? So I had a bit of a look at what was available on the internet in Japanese. And it was rather fascinating.、Um, So, this lady's great grandfather was a man called John Clifford Wilkinson. He's normally known as Clifford Wilkinson.、Um, and he had founded a mineral water business in Takarazuka,、uh, which is near Kobe、uh, in Japan,、um, in 1890.、Um, so, fairly early after the Meiji Restoration, when foreigners started coming into Japan. And、um, this company that he'd founded had actually become one of Japan's leading soft drinks businesses. Um, and Wilkinson had also played an important role in the development of the city of Takarazuka,、uh, which now has a population of nearly a quarter of a million people.、Um, let me just show you where Takarazuka is.、Uh, this isn't a terribly good map because it says Takarazuka here.、Uh, it's actually a bit further south than that, really.、Um, this river is the Muko River, and the main bit of Takarazuka is sort of about here.、Um, So that's where Takarazuka is. You can see Kobe here,、um, which was one of the foreign ports that was opened up in the Meiji period. So there was a foreign settlement in Kobe. And here is the big city of Osaka,、um, traditionally Japan's second biggest city, although actually I think Yokohama is bigger than it these days.、Um, and.、Uh, Yeah, I managed to go and visit Takarazuka myself、uh, last summer. I was in Japan for other reasons. So,、um, but the people there had said, why don't you come and see us and we'll tell you some more stuff about this.、Um, and I was shown all of the relevant sites. And I also met、um, some of the local enthusiasts, including a local historian called Hiroshi Suzuki,、uh, who's done incredible work on this story. And really,、um, what he has produced is very largely. What I'm showing you today, but、um, it's amazing what he has managed to track down, and it really brought the story to life for me.、Um, to put this in context a little bit,、um, about a year ago we had a book launch here、um, for a book which was called Chronicling Westerners in 19th Century East Asia. And it was about a lot of these foreign traders who went to places like Shanghai and, and Japan,、um, and it was based largely on letters that they wrote home to their families. And one thing that struck me about these foreign traders is that most of them had very little interest in the local culture. They just wanted to make a lot of money and go home and live a comfortable life you know, in the Cotswolds.、Um, so, um, but it also strikes me that a lot of the more successful traders were not like that.、Um, and I don't know whether it was because they were rich and successful that they enjoyed staying in the Country they were in, or whether they became rich and successful because they liked the country and they were interested in it and they learned the language and they learned about the people. I couldn't really say.、Um, but certainly, this guy, Clifford Wilkinson, seems to have been pretty happy in Japan. He married a Japanese lady、um, and stayed there essentially for the whole of his life and built a great business.、Uh, 
Um, and in fact, it was something of a dynasty. His family was still there as recently as the 1980s. Um, so John Clifford Wilkinson um, was the son of a banker in Leeds, apparently. Um, and he arrived in Kobe in about 1879. Um, there's some difference in, in the sources as to when he was born, but he can only have been about 17 at the time when he arrived in Kobe. So these people got sent off pretty young. And he worked for a company called E.H. Hunter, which is a foreign trading firm in Kobe. Um, and E.H. Uh, e. Hunter himself was a very interesting British guy. He came from Londonderry originally, and he founded a number of businesses, um, of which the most important went on to become what's now called Hitachi Zosen. Um, Hitachi Shipbuilding, which is one of Japan's largest shipbuilding companies. Um, so he's an interesting man in his own right, but I'm not going to talk about him. Um, and the environment at this time was quite difficult for foreigners. I mean, there were still people who thought they shouldn't be foreigners in Japan and would attack them. Um, so the foreigners mostly lived in uh, the foreign settlements. So there was one in Kobe. And it was quite strictly segregated. Um, anyone going in or out uh, was sort of interrogated by the guards um, in the early days of the foreign settlement. Anyway, Edward Hunter, um, the Clifford, Clifford Wilkinson's boss, um, had a number of businesses and he employed Clifford Wilkinson in a rice polishing mill, um, which was in Kobe. And it's not entirely clear, it's, it says in the newspaper, the, um, the mill actually burnt down um, in 1887. And it's described as being owned at that point by Clifford Wilkinson, but it seems a little unlikely that he actually owned the business. Um, but in any case, he was more or less managing it at that point. The insurance paid out. I suppose if he was the owner, it paid out to him, but we don't know whether he was the owner. Um, I've also read somewhere that his father died at around this time, so he may have come into an inheritance. But in any case, once the rice polishing mill burnt down at the end of 1887, Clifford Wilkinson seems to have been at a bit of a loose end. Um, and uh, it's not clear what he did for the next couple of years, but in 1889, he decided to start this mineral water business based on this spring in Takarazuka. Um, and he describes himself what happened um, in an interview in the Kobe Shimbun uh, over 30 years later. And I, I mean, this is in Japanese, so I don't know what he had, well, he probably was speaking Japanese, but he said in the interview, I like hunting, and I used to go walking around, not only near Kobe, but also further away in the mountains up towards Osaka. And this is how I came to live where I do now. One day in the mountains of Takarazuka, I had done a lot of walking and was unbearably thirsty and my coolie had drunk up the bottle of whiskey I had brought with me. <laughs> um, so I was searching here and there in the valleys for water when I unexpectedly found some cool and clear water. And this is the source of the carbonated water now sold by my business. I'm not sure I believe that story. Um, I mean, uh, taking a, a bottle of whiskey uh, to avoid thirst doesn't strike me as very <laughs> sensible. And I also don't really believe that Cooley would have drunk his boss's whiskey. And the other thing is that the, the mineral spring in Takarazuka is right by the Muko River, which is the second largest river in the whole area. Um, so it can't have been difficult to find water. Um, and presumably the water in the river would be fine because it's coming straight down from the mountains. So I'm not sure I completely believe this story. And actually, Wilkinson does seem to have told a few tall tales, as we'll, we'll discover um, later on. Um, anyway, I've got a, a slightly closer up map now of Takarazuka to show you um, some of the sites. So uh, again, it hasn't come out too well here, but this place now is called Yumotodai Hiroba, or the, the plaza where the water comes out. Um, and so this is the spot, really, where the mineral spring was. And there's been a, an onsen, or hot spring resort, in Takarazuka since the Kamakura period. So that's like 1200 or so. So I think there must have been a few inns here on this side of the river. Um, but it wasn't until 1887 that a company was set up to really try and exploit the onsen in Takarazuka. So you had a few ryokan, or Japanese inns, kind of on this side of the river, um, and you had the, the spring coming up here. On this side, there was nothing at all, uh, which is kind of interesting, because again, you can't read this, but this red star here 
um, tells you where the Takurazuka Review is. Um, Takurazuka now is most famous for its all-female singing and dancing review, and that is the Takurazuka Grand Theatre, where it all happens. Um, so at the time when Wilkinson went there, this place was really off the beaten track. It was an hour and a half by rickshaw um, from the nearest station. Um, and it wasn't until quite a lot later that the, the JR station and the Hankyu station were opened on the opposite bank, which, as I say, was completely empty. Um, and it was Hankyu who decided that to attract more tourists up there, they should open this um, singing and dancing place. But we're not going to talk about that today. Um, is there anything else I want to show you from this map? Well, just to mention at this point that um, later, the big factory of Wilkinson actually moved up here to this, this bend on the river. Um, we'll come to that later on. So, um, there was really nothing much going on in Takurazuka in uh, 1889, 1890. But one thing that had happened is that the people who set up the company to commercialise the onsen resort, uh, who were mostly the the ryokan, or inn owners, um, they'd actually already started to try and market the water um, from Takarazuka. And I'm now going to digress for a bit. I, there are quite a lot of digressions in this talk, but there's, there's all sorts of interesting rabbits to chase, in my opinion. So, um, uh, I learned a lot about soft drinks um, doing this research. Um, Japan has no shortage of water. Um, of high quality drinking water. Um, rainfall in Japan is actually higher than it is in the UK, believe it or not. Um, and the whole country is crisscrossed by rivers running down from the mountains, which mostly provide pretty good water for drinking. Um, and there are lots of wells. Um, so there wouldn't, you'd have thought, be much demand for water in bottles um, or, or even for tap water, um, which still hadn't been really introduced at this time. Um, but of course, tap water was pretty normal in UK cities um, by this time in the 19th century. And it was given additional impetus by problems with cholera. Um, and it was in about 1850 that it was discovered that cholera um, came not from, it was described as a miasma in the air. It was thought to be something in the air originally. But in 1850, somebody worked out that it was actually coming from contaminated drinking water, usually contaminated with human feces. Um, of, of people who had got the cholera bacteria. Um, cholera, by the way, doesn't seem to have existed at all until about 1800. Um, but uh, it arrived in Japan first in 1822, and it spread from Nagasaki, um, which of course was the big foreign trading place. Um, it spread eastward and got as far as Osaka, but it didn't get as far as Edo or, or Tokyo um, in 1822. And then it died out, and it wasn't seen again in Japan until 1858. Um, and the next time it turned up in Japan was in 1877. So we're now getting to the time when Clifford Wilkinson was in Kobe. And after 1877, it became quite a frequent problem. And there were two big cholera epidemics, one in 1879 and one in 1886, that both killed over 100,000 people. Um, so people were quite nervous about um, contaminated water at this point. Um, and uh, so that the time was right, perhaps, for bottled water and indeed tap water at this time. Now I'm going to digress also about fizzy drinks, because one of the features of the water that Wilkinson commercialised was that it's naturally carbonated. It, it, I mean, I've seen it. It's very strongly carbonated, massive bubbles. Um, and that's actually quite unusual uh, in Japan, well, and probably elsewhere. Now, there are additional problems about bottling um, carbonated things. I mean, champagne is the obvious example. You've got a cork, and they used to put a, a frame of twine over the top to hold the cork in, and now obviously that's all, all metal. Um, but it was quite dangerous working in a champagne factory. You know, the, the bottles would often blow up. And, um, so, um, there, anyway, there was a problem with fizzy drinks in particular, but uh, in the 19th century in the UK, quite a lot of new bottle designs were introduced. And in 1872, a chap called Hiram Codd uh, patented this sort of bottle, which you might have seen. It's, so it's a quite thick glass bottle with a sort of marble in it. And if you've ever tried one of these, you push the marble down with your thumb, um, and you can then slide it into this channel here so that it doesn't fall back into the opening again and stop you from pouring the drink. Um, so. That is called a cod neck bottle. 
Uh, and by the way, it, this may be an urban myth, but it's possible that these bottles were the origin of the word codswallop. Um, uh, so <laughs> wallop uh, was a name for quite a strong type of beer. Um, and I guess if you were serving beer out of this sort of bottle, it wouldn't have been as good as having it on tap in a pub, so maybe it was codswallop. Uh, but, uh, anyway, um, so this bottle was introduced in the UK um, in 1872, I think it was. And uh, there was a British guy in Kobe who started uh, fizzy drinks in Kobe using this bottle uh, in 1884. And his drink was called Lamune, um, which some of you, especially if you're Japanese, are probably familiar with. Lamune comes from the English word lemonade. Um, and uh, you can still buy it in Japan and it comes in this kind of bottle so here is this is a standard laminate bottle um, for Japanese people it's got a kind of retro feel this is the sort of thing you had when you were little maybe um, you know it's it's uh, it's gone a bit out of fashion since since then um, but this was introduced in Kobe by a British guy and then in 1886 we had this big cholera outbreak and the Asahi Shimbun reported that this Lamina was good against cholera, um, which is true in a sense, you know. So it really took off. Um, so Lamina was booming in the late 1880s, um, and that's probably why the people running the onsen in Takarazuka thought, well, why don't we bottle our fizzy water and make Lamina out of it? So Lamina is, of course, flavoured with um, lemon and lime um, and lots of other things these days. But um, so they, they produced the flavoured water and started selling it as something called Koban Lamine. Koban was just their brand. It's a kind of Japanese coin, uh, or was a kind of Japanese coin. Um, but they didn't get anywhere. Um, presumably they didn't know what they were doing, marketing soft drinks, being an onsen uh, resort. And perhaps the market was becoming crowded. There were a lot of laminates introduced at around this time. So they sort of gave up. And it was at this point in 1889 that Clifford Wilkinson was up there hunting. So whether or not he really stumbled on the water in the way he describes, I don't know, but um, he decided there was a business to be built here. And I think his big insight was that the market for this mineral water was not really in Japan. Um, it was an export market. And of course, as a foreigner, he was well placed to capitalize on that. So he did a deal with the onsen people um, that he would pay them one lin, which is one thousandth of a yen, um, per two, two go, uh, which is a Japanese liquid measure. Um, so two go is about a little over a third of a litre. Um, he would pay them one rin for every third of a litre of stuff that he sold. And he set up a factory and started selling the water um, in 1890. And uh, I got, by the way, if you want to come and look at some of these things afterwards, a, a slightly better copy of this image. Um, but this is his factory in the fairly early day. And this chap here has got a moustache and a hat and looks a little stout. That's Clifford Wilkinson. And the boxes here say Tanzan on them. Um, and then all his staff, you can't really see very clearly in this, but uh, the staff are all lined up in front of his business. Um, and in terms of where, where exactly this was, um, he produced loads and loads of postcards which he sent out to mar market his water. Um, so there's the river. This is the onsen resort here. Um, the actual spring is probably about here, just by the bridge, which you can't see. And these two buildings are his bottling plant um, in Taikorazuka. And as you can see, there's absolutely nothing on the other side of the river. Um, so, I mean, that's from a different era, but when things were built on the other side of the river. But this is sort of by the bridge, which is called the Horai Bridge. Um, and there's still a little marker there where the water um, comes up. So um, Wilkinson thought there was an opportunity to market this water overseas, I think. And he, from the very beginning, set up a network of sales agents around mostly the colonies of East Asia, not just British colonies. Um, but by 1892, which is just two years after he started, he already had sales agents in Shanghai, Manila, Singapore, North Borneo, Colombo in Sri Lanka, Hong Kong, um, Calcutta, Bombay, uh, and in Brisbane. Um, and of course, he advertised his product in the local English language newspapers in all of these places. So there's quite a lot of 
Wilkinson adverts that um, Mr. Suzuki has tracked down. Um, and so there are advertisements in Singapore, certainly as early as 1891. It was clear that you know, the export market was what he was going for. He also sent the water back to London to be analysed. Um, obviously, he wanted to say that it was fantastic, and it was, apparently. Um, he ended up marketing two different types um, from two different springs in Takarazuka. So one of them was a table water, um, and even that was supposed to be pretty good for you. Um, it said uh, in one of his advertisements, that it, but of course you can't believe all of his advertisements, but it said it contained 8% more iron carbonate than any similar spa yet known. Um, but the other water he was selling, he described as medicinal water. So this was, I think, aimed at that market of Victorian hypochondriacs who, who used to you know, want, want to go to Skegness because it was bracing and um, to drink uh, you know, pretty filthy uh, tasting water. Like, I don't know if you ever drunk the water at Bath, but it tastes horrible, but it's supposed to be good for you. So this water is absolutely packed with uh, salt and iron and God knows what, and is supposed to be very good for you. But even uh, Wilkinson's own agent in Shanghai recommended people not to drink it for more than a week at a time. Um, and it, it, it never really took off, actually. Um, as late as 1903, so we're now 13 years into this business, uh, a foreign visitor to Takarazuka was told by Wilkinson's people there that it was a new product, and he was given six bottles to take home. But it certainly wasn't a new product. Um, anyway, so originally it was, brand, it was branded Takarazuka Medicinal Water and Takarazuka, um, i trying to remember the other one, just uh, Mineral Water. But the uh, sales agents in Singapore complained that Takarazuka was too long and too difficult for foreigners to pronounce and couldn't he come up with something snappier. Um, so he consulted the British consul in Kobe, who was a mate of his, and the consul suggested Tansan. Um, so Tansan is the Japanese word meaning carbonated. Um, and it seemed appropriate. Um, so Wilkinson Tansan was born as the brand in 1893, and originally he just printed the word Tansan in big letters diagonally over the existing labels. Um, and uh, he subsequently produced a, a separate brand called Niwo for the medicinal water. You can see it says at the top there, N-I-W-O, Niwo. Um, the Niwo... Uh, well, I think the idea that so the Niwa are the two so called diva kings who stand guard outside a Buddhist temple. I don't know if you've ever seen these fierce two kings. That's, I'll show you one in a minute. Um, so the idea was that if you drank this medicinal water, your stomach would be as strong as a Niwa. Um, and I'm sure it would have been. And in fact, um, probably the main site uh, in uh, Takarazuka or close to Takarazuka is a rather lovely temple called Nakayama Dera. I took this photograph when I was there last summer. It's a bit difficult to see here, but it's got an incredible blue um, paint on the, on the underside that is, I thought was really beautiful. Um, but here is one of the Niwa um, standing guard outside the temple. And so this was presumably the inspiration for calling the medicinal water Niwa. And the Niwa image came to be used on the labels of all of uh, the mineral water. But you can see, I mean, if we look at the image on the left, which is probably the biggest one and is also the most standard. I mean, they obviously experimented with various things. Um, that is based on that Niwa with the, I don't know what that ribbon thing is going around, but they have those. So, um, but it's carrying a bottle of Wilkinson Tansan mineral water, of course. Um, it's also got a handlebar moustache. I don't know if you can see that, but um, it is thought to be quite closely based on Wilkinson himself. And actually, um, if you look at the actual Niwa, it's got a six-pack. It's quite fit. Um, but if you look at the one on the label, it's got a bit of a paunch, um, uh, which I think might be more like... So maybe he actually modelled uh, for this, this brand. Anyway... Um, so that was the, the birth of Wilkinson Tansan. And although I said it was mainly for export, it was, of course, served in Japan too, particularly at high-end hotels and restaurants of the sort that were dealing with foreigners. Uh, and apparently the Meiji government wanted uh, a table water they could serve to visiting dignitaries, and, and so they used Wilkinson Tansan as well. Um, and then another thing that Wilkinson did um, was to introduce the bottle top. I think it's technically called the crown cap. Um, 
This was invented in Baltimore uh, in 1892. And Wilkinson cottoned on to this quite fast and introduced it into Japan, I think in 1896. So he was the first person to use them um, in Japan. Um, and that, of course, helps. Um, well, I think it's a lot cheaper to, to make the bottles or to buy the bottles than those complicated glass ones with marbles in. And probably lighter as well if you're shipping it around the place. And by the way, it was quite tricky to get the water out because there was no railway at that point um, going from Takarazuka. You had to actually... I think it was taken by ox cart to, to Kobe um, and then shipped out from there. Um, yeah, and, and this water is pretty bubbly, as I said. So when I was in Takarazuka last summer, the president of the Wakamizu Hotel, which sits exactly on the site, took me down to the machine room in the basement of the hotel. And we climbed across a ladder and went into all these you know, very... Um, sort of back, behind the scenes sort of spaces, and we peered down a hole into a well using the, our mobile phones as torches, and we could see this water absolutely, you know, fizzing up like crazy, and you can also see it bubbling up in the river, um, which is right next to the hotel. So it needed a good um, stopper on the top. But um, Wilkinson seems to have been a consummate marketer, and he wanted to convince everyone his water was better than anybody else's. And he wanted people to come to Takarazuka and see it. Um, but Takarazuka was a bit inaccessible and tricky, certainly, as a day trip. I mean, you'd have to spend three hours in a rickshaw um, from Nishinomiya. So right from the beginning, he decided the answer was to build a hotel um, and put foreigners up there. So he built the Tansan Hotel. Um, which actually opened in about 1891, so um, I think 1890, actually, um, the very first year that he started his business. Now, of course, there weren't very many Western-style hotels in Japan at this point. The Imperial Hotel itself only opened in 1890. That's the sort of grand dame of Tokyo um, Western hotels. Um, there were, I think, about three in Kobe, and there were several in Kyoto, which, of course, was already becoming a major tourist destination. But to have a hotel in the middle of nowhere like this um, was slightly bizarre. Um, actually, the Fujiya Hotel in Hakone uh, was already open about 10 years before this, so that's an exception. But Hakone was a f already a famous resort area close to Mount Fuji. Takarazuka nobody could even pronounce and, and nobody had heard of. So this hotel, um, and it seems to have been a wonderful hotel, was, was opened there. Um, and it cost more than double the ryokan, the traditional Japanese inns that were nearby. Um, and apparently, according to one visitor, the only Japanese things in the whole hotel, he said, were the mats and the maids. Um, so all the furniture and fittings that had been shipped in through the foreign community in Kobe. Um, my suspicion is this hotel never made any money. Um, but I'm not sure if that really mattered, because it was about marketing Takurazuka and marketing the water. Um, a foreign visitor in 1895 uh, stayed at the hotel, and I only have a Japanese translation from this guy, Suzuki, of what he wrote in his diary, but the word used in Japanese was motainai, which, so this hotel was a bit of a waste. Um, and uh, the, the visitor says it's superlatively comfortable and occupies a wonderful position with a great view, um, but he realized that he was the only guest. Um, and he looked in the guest book and, and there weren't too many guests you know, at all who'd signed the book and his impression it was, was that it was mainly used by people from Kobe who came up for the weekend um, so it never had very many visitors and I think things must have got worse and worse because the railway line was gradually extended up to Takarazuka and there was also a railway line built across from Osaka as well or an electric tramway or something um, so Takarazuka became more and more accessible and there was really no need to stay overnight in this place where there was nothing at all going on apart from this big bottling plant um, and I suppose the onsen. Um, but this hotel does seem to have put Takarazuka on the map. Um, so Wilkinson inserted advertisements for his water and his hotel in Murray's handbook. Uh, if you were a foreigner visiting Japan around this time, you would have had a copy of Murray's handbook. Um, Murray was the publisher. It was actually, um, what's his name, Basil Hall Chamberlain was the main author, I think. Um, so Wilkinson put advertisements in it, and from 1893, uh, in the third edition, Takarazuka began to be included as a tourist destination. Um, so that's probably because 
Wilkinson was advertising in it. Um, but the, the hotel actually, you know, eventually closed in 1915. I don't think it had ever done terribly well, but it, there was a comment in a Japanese tourist magazine the following year that it had probably closed because it was getting so easy to do day trips to Takarazuka, so there was no need for it. Um, but it seems to have been a, a very fine hotel in its day, and also Wilkinson apparently set up a small farm nearby to provide the milk and meat and things that foreigners would want to eat, so it was quite a big deal. Anyway, um, when I talk about the closure of the hotel, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but essentially Wilkinson was a great marketer. He told a few tall tales, um, but the business went pretty well. Now, there was a rocky moment in 1897 when there was a big flood in Takadazuka that swept away the whole onsen resort, including his bottling plant. I think the hotel was okay because it was on a hill. Um, and then Wilkinson obviously had cash flow difficulties and he fell behind with the payments he was supposed to be making for the water to the onsen company. But good money was being made um, by this Wilkinson firm, so they did a deal and the business carried on. Um, and in fact, by around 1904, he was selling so much water that the original spring had run dry, pretty much, and he needed to find another one. So that's why he shifted up the river to a place called Namaze. It's not very far up the river, but technically it isn't in Takarazuka at all. Um, but he, he did continue to market the water as coming from Takarazuka, because I think it would have been a pain to change all the marketing spiel at that point. So as I showed you earlier... Um, oh, hang on. Where have I got... That's just a marking place. Huh? So the, the new factory was up at that big bend uh, in the river. Um, and he you know, did it on a grand scale. Um, this is a, a model of the factory. Um, but it employed about 100 people. It was designed by uh, quite a leading architect, somebody called Kikutaro Shimoda. Uh, Shimoda was the designer of the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank's Nagasaki branch, which still stands there, it's now a museum. Um, and he also built the Tor Hotel, which was an amazing hotel in Kobe that sadly burned down in 1950, but a uh, massive sort of Swiss chalet style uh, hotel. Um, so this was a high profile architect, and you can see everything was in white, picked out in red. And I'm sure Wilkinson intended to use this in his marketing, and indeed he did. Um, so here's another one of his postcards showing the front door. That's not a terribly glamorous looking postcard, but um, um, you know, this, this one comes from 1941, um, so much, much later, but you can still see the big factory in the background with the pristine mountains behind and Wilkinson Tansan, the aristocrat of table waters. Um, so, um, and, and back in the 1900s, the early 1900s, this was really the only thing in town. So an American visitor in 1903 commented in his diary, Takarazuka is, an Takarazuka is an extremely small town consisting more or less of Nyokan and the Tansan and Niwo bottling. <coughs> Eight million bottles of Tansan were produced last year. Well, that's what he was told anyway. Um, and he noted that the town was on the south bank of the river and there wasn't anything much on the north side. Um, so anyway, as the business grew, um, they actually opened a special station um, in order to ship this stuff out by train from the new factory. Um, and they were increasing exports to the States as well as to places like the Philippines and Hong Kong and China and India and so on. And the firm started to diversify. So you had new products like indeed lemonade and ginger ale. So here is ginger ale um, and uh, various bottles of stuff. There's also you know, lemonade on the right there. And in this collection, um, I was puzzled actually to see here, there's even still Tansan, um, which seems to me to slightly, <laughs> slightly defeat the object. Um, but um, he, he was doing great. And there are some statistics actually, because um, there was a book written by a chap called Ken Kurashima. Um, it's called something rather boring sounding, like New Researches into the Mineral Water Industry. It was published in 1915, believe it or not. Um, and he estimated in his book that um, up to 99% of all of Japan's mineral water exports were Tansan. Um, and this is borne out. I mean, there were other waters. There were other fizzy waters at this time. Um, there's a water which is still going called Hirano water, and they were trying to sell this. Um, but um, in the company history of Meiji, 
um, a food company. It says they were trying to sell this, but they, they, the history says, although Wilkinson Tansan from Takarazuka, created by the Englishman Wilkinson, sold well, for some reason Hirano Water didn't sell. And I think it was his marketing now that was probably the difference. Um, uh, the, the book actually says, not the book, the statistics say, I've um, got some statistics somewhere here, it tells you the total exports of Japanese mineral water. And since um, most of Wilkinson's product was export, then his figures can't have massively exceeded that. Um, I reckon in 1912, which is when we have the figures for, his total production was probably around 3 million bottles. So it certainly can't have been 8 million bottles 10 years before, which is when this person visited the smaller factory. Um, so that was probably just a tall story. Um, but there was a lot of stuff going out here. Um, and Wilkinson really uh, tried it on when it came to his advertising. And you probably can't read this here, so I'll read it out to you. But it says on this advertisement um, up here, um, in, 19, in 1909, 250 of the most distinguished medical practitioners of North America petitioned Congress on the broad principle of humanity to remove the custom duties on Tansan water. <laughs> uh, and because of its, its exceptional purity and unrivaled and unique medicinal qualities to allow it to enter the United States free of duty. And it, uh, it says there, see the congressional record of that date. Well, I, I haven't checked the congressional records and I doubt anybody else would either. I'm pretty skeptical uh, of this story. Um, but it's mentioned again in this extraordinary puff piece, um, uh, which, again, Suzuki-san found. Um, so this is in 1910 in uh, the Illustrated Sporting and Dramatic News, a, a London weekly magazine. And 1910 uh, was the year of the Japan-British exhibition uh, at White City. Um, so there was a big Japanese thing going on there. And it was in connection, I suppose, with that, that Wilkinson managed to get this Piece. It's not described as an advertisement, but you know, uh, this doesn't seem to me to be editorially objective. And I will quote you a few things. So basically, oh, I should say, by the way, that, um, oh gosh, that's really come out badly on this slide, but there was a little Tansan kiosk at the exhibition in White City. Uh, it says up here on the top, Tansan, and it's got little Tori gates going into it. Um, but anyway, let me quote you some of this extraordinary puff piece. So it's, it's called Japanese Endurance, a curious theory to account for the hardihood of the little brown man. Um, and and two, two British men are discussing, you know, what tough people the Japanese are. It starts, sturdy little chaps, said the colonel. <laughs> um, you get the general idea. <laughs> anyway, um, they go on to discuss... Um, by the way, of course, 1910, this is just after... 1905 was the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, which the Japanese won. Um, so there were a lot of people talking about what good fighters the Japanese were, and they were rather astonished that a major European power had been defeated by uh, an Asian country. So, um, you know, it, it's in that context, I think, that this discussion is going on. And one of the people in this conversation um, goes on to describe examples of Japanese soldiers having their legs shot off, and then with, they don't emit so much as a groan, but just ask for a cigarette and this sort of thing. Um, <laughs> And uh, the other person explains, all the water in the wells and springs of the country are more or less impregnated with tonic ingredients, such as we only find in certain of our springs in Europe. Your Japanese drinks any amount of water. This doesn't seem like the Japanese people I know, I must say. He very rarely takes spirits, seldom wine, and only on holiday occasions does he indulge in light beer or any other mild alcoholic festivity. But he likes his water and has various kinds of it. And when he stands himself treat or asks a friend to join him, he orders a bottle of sparkling water from one or the other famous medicinal springs in Japan. For instance, he will order a bottle of Tansan. So the article then goes on to say, Tansan is perhaps the most interesting exhibit in the Japan British display. And this has been news to Wikipedia, which doesn't mention Tansan at all in its article uh, about the Japan British exhibition of 1910. And it goes on to describe how Wilkinson was struggling to keep up with the enormous demand for his product. It repeats, <coughs> repeats the story about the appeal to Congress in America. Um, and then it says, works capable of churning out several hundred thousand bottles a day are now in course of construction. A great tract of hill land 
having been excavated and leveled, which is completely untrue. I mean, the factory had already been built six years before, and, and although no doubt small additions were made to it, um, there was never any new factory built like that. Also, several hundred thousand bottles a day would work out at at least 50 million bottles a year, I think, and, and Wilkinson certainly no, never got anywhere near that kind of number. One other thing that was interesting in that article is um, it describes the waiter deftly removed the little seal stopper with a tiny loop instrument. So we're talking about a bottle opener here. So even in 1910, it seems that um, metal bottle tops were not that <coughs> commonly known uh, in London. Anyway, um, so it was a good business. Clifford Wilkinson died in 1923 when he was on holiday in uh, the Côte d'Azur in France, and he's buried in Montan uh, in south-east France. Um, one other fascinating thing I found about him, he was interviewed in 1920, three years before he died, by the Kobe Shimbun as one of the grand old foreign residents for his reminiscences. And the newspaper introduces him as a famous lover of monkeys. Um, apparently, at one point, he was keeping 78 monkeys in his house in Takarazuka. Um, but the newspaper sort of hints that his wife wasn't too happy uh, about this. Um, and uh, the monkeys tended to escape as well. And by the time of the interview in 1920, he was down to just one pet monkey um, in his house. So, again, this hasn't come out very well. It was, looked a lot better <laughs> on my computer screen. But anyway, this is a family tree. Because um, I'm now going to tell you a little bit about what happened after John Clifford Wilkinson died. So that's him. Uh, he had a Japanese wife called um, Nakagawa Kuma, and uh, she had, well, they had two daughters who had both Japanese and British names, but calling them by their British names, they were called Ethel and Phyllis. And Ethel married this chap, Joseph Price. Um, Joseph Price was uh, from Manchester, he was an accountant, and he came out to join the business as the company secretary um, to Clifford Wilkinson. He married Wilkinson's daughter in 1911 and was seen as the likely successor to the business. But in fact, he died only five years later, um, which is rather unfortunate. So, but he did leave four children behind him. Um, and then when Clifford Wilkinson died, the eldest of these children, uh, Herbert Price, would only have been about 11. Um, Anyway, Ethel, the daughter, took over the business and ran it herself. Um, and once her son Herbert had completed his education, he went to the US for four years to university. Uh, he was appointed managing director in 1932, when he would have been only about 20, I think. Um, Ethel, meanwhile, uh, outlived her husband by a full 50 years and didn't die until 1966. Now you can imagine, although this was a great business and making a lot of money, things started to get difficult uh, as we get into the 30s and approach the Second World War. Um, British people were not popular in Japan at that time. Um, I think that Herbert Price tried to get around this by setting up the entity as a Japanese company. And for most of its history, it was actually a British company um, headquartered in Hong Kong with a branch office in Kobe. Uh, that was the structure that was set up in 1904 when the big new factory was opened up the river. Um, in 1937, they set up a Japanese company, um, but I'm afraid it didn't fool anybody. And um, so once you get into the 40s, things are quite difficult. And in 1940, Herbert Price was arrested uh, on suspicion of being a spy. Um, there were actually, I think, 11 British people arrested on the same day uh, on suspicion of being a spy ring. The leader of the spy ring was a chap called James Cox. It wasn't really a spy ring, by the way, I don't think. But James Cox was the head of the Reuters Bureau in Tokyo, and he actually is said to have committed suicide by jumping out of the window of the military police headquarters while he was being interrogated a few days later. Um, Herbert Price didn't suffer anything quite as bad as that and was released a few days after he had been arrested. Um, but in the summer of 1941, uh, there was a new ordinance from the Ministry of Finance uh, entitled Regulations Restricting Transactions Involving Foreigners. And the, the Wilkinson business was basically seized by the Japanese government. Um, and uh, then, of course, once Japan entered the war in December 1941, um, poor old Herbert Price was interned uh, for the next four years, basically, until the war ended. Um, his mother, who was, of course, half Japanese, 
uh, although I think she took British nationality when she married, um, she didn't suffer quite as much, but she was forced out of her house, which I think was probably quite a grand one, and made to live next to the factory um, for the next few years. The, the company was put under administration of the Industrial Bank of Japan, and Industrial Bank of Japan um, in 1942 sold all the shares to a company called Dainipon Beer. Um, and uh, Dainipon Beer changed the company name from Wilkinson to Dainipon, Dainipon Mineral Water, um, but it did actually continue to sell the products under the Wilkinson Tansan brand, possibly because they were mostly going overseas, so I don't think Dainipon would have been a great um, marketing word, uh, perhaps for some of the markets. Um, by the end of the war, mineral water was not really a priority in Japan, and the factory stopped producing water altogether and was turned over to um, a company called Kawanishi Aircraft Company and started making seaplanes. Um, but that didn't last long because, of course, the war ended um, in 1945. So um, Herbert Price was released from internment. He went straight to the Americans and said, I want my company back. And he got it back um, reasonably quickly. And he also got orders from the Americans to supply mineral water to the troops. Um, but he has some cash flow problems. He needed now to buy a whole load of crates and bottles and caps and stuff, and he didn't have any money. Um, and he was lent some money by Dynapon Beer, in fact, the company that had taken over his company during the war. And I think there was a personal relationship behind this, which was to prove quite important. Um, one of the directors of Dynapon Beer was a man called Yamamoto Tamesaburo, and he'd originally founded a bottle manufacturing company in Osaka. Um, and his bottle manufacturing company was eventually absorbed into Dainipo Beer, and he, that's how he became a director of it. But he'd been the person selling bottles to Wilkinson in the pre-war period, so they knew each other. Um, and uh, anyway, Dainipo Beer was broken up by the Japanese authorities after the war because they didn't like too large concentrations of economic power. Um, they split it up into Sapporo Brewery and Asahi Brewery, both of which um, you'll be familiar with, uh, I hope. And, um, in fact, Yamamoto became the first president of Asahi Brewery um, in uh, 1949, when the company was established. And this relationship was to develop further, but I'm just going to do another little digression about orange juice uh, next. So, again, I did some research on orange juice. And I must say, I thought that orange juice had been around for ages, but it hasn't. Um, it seems that if you wanted orange juice until about the war, you had to squeeze oranges. Um, and it was only in the 1940s that the Florida Department of Citrus found a way to freeze and concentrate orange in such a way that it could be sold as orange juice. Uh, a little before that, there was a company in California called Byerly's. A man called Byerly set up an orange juice company. It wasn't pure orange juice, though. It was sort of sugared and um, slightly diluted. Um, but um, Herbert Price and the Wilkinson Company did a deal with General Foods, which by this time owned the Byerly's brand, to start selling Byerly's orange in Japan. Uh, initially just to the US troops, but then they put it on general sale in 1950, and that was actually the first um, fruit juice drink uh, in Japan, and it was a big hit, so yet another success for the Wilkinson Company. Um, and interestingly, the Byerly's brand has now been discontinued everywhere else in the world, except for Japan, and you can still, I mean, I've often seen it in like onsen hotels, and slightly sort of old-fashioned establishments tend to stock it. So, um, anyway, the link with Asahi Breweries was to prove important. Um, they lent some money to Wilkinson uh, just after the war, and in 1951, Wilkinson decided to farm out its marketing in the Japanese market to Asahi Breweries. And I guess Wilkinson had always been an export company, really. If they wanted to grow in the Japanese market, they needed a powerful Japanese marketing partner. Um, and of course, there was this long-standing relationship between the president of Asahi Breweries and the Wilkinson company. Um, so anyway, the business continued to grow nicely. Um, but it seems that Herbert Price didn't really have any um, heirs to to take over the business when he wanted to retire. He didn't retire until 1983. Um, but as far as I can tell, he didn't marry or have any children. Um, and I think most of the rest of his family had left Japan in you know, the pre-war period when things were getting a bit ropey. Um, his sister had remained with him uh, living in Takarazuka. 
Um, but I don't think there was anyone obvious to pass the business on to. So he simply sold it to us at he breweries, um, lock, stock and barrel, and retired to Switzerland. Um, and to give you an idea of how big a business this was, um, in fiscal 1984, the Japanese National Tax Agency started publishing a, a sort of ranking of the top taxpayers in Japan. And the first year it was published in 1984, um, Herbert Price was in there. Um, he was ranked... Uh, 69th. And the next year, which was, uh, he was obviously selling various things, including I think some of his houses, uh, he was actually ranked second, the second highest taxpayer in Japan. Um, and his estimated income that year would have been around 3.3 billion yen, which is around 21 million pounds. Um, so he took quite a lot of money back with him to Switzerland. Um, unfortunately, his retirement wasn't all that long. He was um, killed in a traffic accident in Monaco uh, about three years later and strangely ended up in the same cemetery as his grandfather um, in Monton, which is just close to Monaco. Um, so, um, and, and really after the whole thing was sold to Asahi, the connections with Takarazuka kind of faded. Um, the big factory that I showed you up the river it was closed in 1990 and Asahi shifted production um, to their factory in Akashi, which is to the other side of Kobe on the west. Um, in recent years, though, they have started to play up the long history of the brand. So this is some of their advertisement. And there, there's the picture of Wilkinson in front of his factory, and, and that's Wilkinson and so on. Um, so there's a bit of renewed interest in this Wilkinson story. But I have to say that when I went to Takarazuka in the summer, there wasn't much left um, of the Wilkinson story. Um, there's a little marker where the spring is, right next to the Wakamizu Hotel. And there was also the world's only Wilkinson Tansan vending machine. <laughs> uh, uh, right, right there. Um, and obviously the original bottling plant, the very old one with him standing outside with the car, you know, that closed, uh, I don't know, a century or so ago. Um, but the big factory um, still operated until 1990, uh, and then it was torn down in 1995 to make a block of flats. And I suppose it's a prime site next to the river. You can't really expect that they'd have kept a massive factory like that. Um, and right next to the block of flats, there's a small community center. And if you go up the stairs and past the table tennis table, there's a room up the back, um, which is a little archive of Wilkinson stuff, which is where I got quite a lot of those images I showed you. And I imagine what happened is that when the factory was torn down, those various things, including the model of the factory building, would have been in the factory itself and were kind of rescued. So there is a little archive there. Um, there's actually an advertisement for the archive here. So that was when it first opened. Um, but what I think is really sad is that the Wilkinson Mansion didn't survive. And this is just the last thing I want to digress about a little bit. Um, the family had bought a nice site in central Takarazuka um, sometime early in the 20th century. Um, but by the 1960s, Ethel, uh, the elder daughter of Clifford Wilkinson, was getting pretty old and she couldn't walk. Um, she was in a wheelchair. Um, and Herbert, her son, decided to remodel, well, in fact, completely rebuild the house and build a new mansion. And money was kind of no object. So he brought in a famous architect, uh, Antonin Raymond, who was one of the people that Frank Lloyd Wright took over to Japan to work on the Imperial Hotel um, around 1920. And he was a friend of Herbert Bryce's anyway. Um, and so Raymond then, he, he was famous for his work with concrete. There was lots of stuff you could do, you know, making curved shapes with concrete. Um, and Raymond persuaded him to do something rather experimental. So this is a floor plan of the house. Um, this is the actual house here. You can see it's all curved. There's a heated swimming pool here. Um, it had three maid rooms. Um, I think those may be tennis courts, I'm not sure, uh, here. It's a big site. I mean, I saw the site and you could fit about 40 normal Japanese houses on this site. Um, so, yeah, it got links through the pool. It also had a kind of nuclear bunker in the basement, um, just in case, um, mm -hmm. because that was a concern in the 1960s. And one extraordinary feature, I think this is the lift, but somebody somewhere wrote that was the first <coughs> lift in a house in Japan. Um, this is 1962. And the reason for the lift, of course, was Ethel. 
um, in her wheelchair, but it wasn't just to get her upstairs to the bedroom. Um, across the road, I think on this side, was Ethel's rose garden, which she loved. And the lift enabled her to go down into the basement from where they produced a tunnel that went under the public road and came up in the rose garden on the other side so that she wouldn't have to mingle with the plebs. Um, well, maybe that wasn't the reason. but um, And this is a picture of the, the mansion. You can see, you know, it was quite... Uh, it was featured in architectural magazines at the time. So what happened to it, you may well be wondering. Well, um, as far as I can see, um, Herbert Price didn't sell it when he left Japan, possibly because his sister may still have been living in it. Uh, um, one of his younger sisters uh, was still alive, so maybe he let her live in it. Um, but of course, he, well, he died, and his sister also died in um, 1992. Um, and so whoever inherited at that point would have had an enormous amount of death duties and stuff to pay. There would be a lot of tax, and probably didn't want a mansion in Takarazuka, which is the middle of nowhere, well, uh, arguably. Um, so it was sold, and it was bought by the local supermarket, which promptly knocked it down and turned it into a car park. Um, so it's, it's still a car park. And I think this is really sad because, I mean, many of you, I'm sure, have been to Nagasaki, but the main tourist attraction in Nagasaki is Glover House and Glover Gardens. And this could have been, you know, quite an attraction uh, in the centre of Takarazuka and could have been a great place to display the whole history of the family. But sadly, um, it isn't. Um, I did discover one other legacy of this firm, which I thought was interesting. Um, the Philippines was one of the major markets for uh, Wilkinson Water. And I discovered that the word pansan in both of the main Philippine languages means a bottle top. Um, and it seems that that came from, obviously it's from the Japanese, tansan, but somehow the meaning has changed uh, over in the Philippines. So even today, tansan means a bottle top um, in, in the Philippines. But in Takarazuka, um, really, nothing much remains. So there's a small room uh, up the back stairs in a community centre. There's a few very keen local history enthusiasts who I had the pleasure to meet. And, of course, there is the water itself, which is still visibly bubbling up in the river. So that is the end of my presentation. I'll be very happy to take any questions.